that that people will say to me, well, you know, I don't have to submit my account, so I'll get my bin liners out and I'll put everything in together uh, two months before my submission deadline. I'm like, but how are you managing your business if you don't really know what's going on? Um, if you haven't got online bookkeeping system and you're not keeping up to date, well, how are you managing your business? For me, this is crazy. I wouldn't really run my business that way. Um, so let's talk about what these things are anyway. So profit and loss account is a, is a financial tool to show you the income cost of your business. It will also produce, uh, so if, you, if you've got product services, then it will tell you if your, those kind of products and services are making a loss or a profit, and you can then do something about it. If it's visible, if you don't do your online bookkeeping systems and keep them up to date monthly, then you won't know if you're making profit and you burying your head isn't going to help you at all. So what I've done is I've taken this from a perspective of a uh, rental business here. So here we're saying £10,000 worth of rental income, £2,000 worth of direct costs gives you a gross profit of 7000 You've then got £3,000 worth of indirect costs and therefore you've got £4,000 worth of profit. Now, you know, these numbers aren't really telling us too much right now, but it, it does say to me, well, this business, this rental business is generating a healthy profit and therefore not a bad way of running a company at all or a business. Now, one thing I would say is useful to use Zero or QuickBooks, and this is a Zero example, whereby if you've got 10,000 pounds worth of rental income, is it static or is it moving? Now, rental income for me, if you've got several properties, then you should have 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 going in each month um, for as long as you've got those properties. And if it's fluctuating, as in the rental income is going down, then that must tell me that you've got prop, uh, properties that are unoccupied or some rooms that in your HMO that are unoccupied. And what are you going to do about it? Because if you've got now visibility that you've got these kind of three months and the £10,000 is not static, it's actually moving up and down, then that's not a good thing at all. And you need to be taking action on that. Um, now, it could move clearly because if you sell a property, then you'd expect rental income to go down. If you buy properties, then you expect the rental income to go up. But if you've got the same amount of properties, then I would say you should be looking for maximum occupation. So whether that's 95% or 100% for what you're doing in your business and making sure that that rental income is as high as possible and it is consistent across all the months that you own that property. Let's take an example now of £2,000 direct costs as the per example. And we're talking about HMO here. And this is whereby we may have letting agent costs. So that's a direct cost, okay? For, and we talk about direct costs as the direct costs associated with generating that income. So if you're using a letting agent, that is exact the direct cost of running the tenants to generate that property income. You've got utility costs because ultimately, Without that, you know, without utilities, you're not going to have a rental income. So ultimately, that is a direct cost. You've got telephone broadband for HMO uh, users. You'll have mortgage interest. Now, I can, you, you can decipher this one. Is mortgage interest a direct cost or an indirect cost? And for me, it's a direct cost because it's running at the cost that's running your business. And therefore, without that property, without that mortgage, you wouldn't have a rental income. So therefore, that I, for me, that's a direct cost. You may have maintenance costs. Again, it's quite subjective. Should it be direct or indirect? Personally, I think it's direct because it is, again, running your rental income. Now, there could be two elements here. You could have maintenance costs and then refurbishment costs. The maintenance costs is whilst the tenants are in that property and another cost for indirect costs, which is all about the, re, uh, the refurbishment of a property when it's been emptied. You've got cleaning costs and legal fees. Now, legal fees I'm talking about here is not the purchase of a property, but I'm talking about tenant issues, section 21, section, uh, section 8, section 21 of evicting those particular tenants. So all of those costs are going to be direct. And now what I'm, I'm going to suggest here again is one thing you should be doing with all of your accounts is looking at the month by month and saying, well, is it static? Is it moving? Now, letting agency fees, it should be pretty much linear with the income. So that shouldn't really change, but you should be able to get a percentage to say of my income 
I know that letting agency cost is 10%. Now, if it's 15% the next month, then there's a problem. Maybe they're overcharging you and you need to investigate that. If you've got um, a, a huge gas bill, electricity bill that you wasn't expecting, it was a surprise and you, it's not in your bin line of receipts, it's now visible in zero. You can do something about it. Maybe changing your electricity supplier. Uh, you could have another surprise in terms of maintenance costs. If you've got a tenant that's bashing your house about and you've got maintenance costs as a result of that, well, maybe you need to be asking the question, well, what are you doing in my property? Uh, I'm going to charge you that maintenance cost and, uh, as a result of your, your damage. And you may want to look at your ASTs to look at damage caused by a tenant and who is liable for that kind of cost and how they will pay it and make sure that they sign that part of the AST to make sure that they're happy, not happy, but that they are willing and in the knowledge that they will be paying those maintenance costs. So again, you can only do this if you've got zero or QuickBooks on a month by month basis to really see whether your costs are static, moving, what's going on with each of my cost lines and what can I do about it to help me improve my profit in my limited company and therefore be happy. Again, indirect costs here could be office costs. So if you are running your property business and you're, uh, you've got an office that you've hired out, that clearly isn't a direct cost because it's not a direct cost associated with the rental of the properties. It's more to do with the running of the business. Your own mobile phone costs. Now, that's not a tenant cost, is it? That's your cost and therefore it's indirect. I had to put the next one in, guys. This is the accountancy fees. You may have accountancy fees, you may have bookkeeping fees, all of those costs will be indirect, as of will be your software costs, and then legal fees generic. So if you've got, uh, you know, not legal purchase fees, because that's capital costs, but if you've got legal fees in terms of advice that they're giving to you, and it's not towards a specific property, and it's generic, therefore I believe that should be an indirect cost. But by doing this, by splitting these costs by direct and indirect, it helps you track um, your gross profit and therefore on a month by month basis, you can see, is my gross profit going up and down? Am I in control of it? What actions do I need to take to make sure my gross profit is high as possible? And uh, is there anything I could do about my indirect costs? And again, same thing here. You're looking at your, uh, your indirect costs. Is it static? Is it moving? Is it controllable? Is there something I should be doing about it? But looking at the numbers month in, month out, in your zero account, all your QuickBooks is the best way to control your business and to help you generate as much profit as possible. Like I say, you can't do any of this stuff if you're using uh, bent liners to store your financial information and then kind of cobbling a spreadsheet together or cobbling your online bookkeeping system two months before your submission date. That's far too late, guys. It's been and gone. There's nothing you can really do about it. 18 months have passed, and you are probably making a lot less money than those people that are keeping on top of their finances on a month-by-month -month basis. And if you want to get really advanced, then I would say maybe looking at budgets. So this is whereby, and you'll notice here, we've got a particular uh, scenario here, whereby they haven't done any budgeting. Why should you use a budget? Well, for me, if you put, um, we talked about £10,000 worth of rental income, if you've got a budget and you're doing an actual versus budget and you've got £8,000 actual rental income coming in and your budget was £10,000, you've got this red number now appearing, £2,000, which means you've generated £2,000 less than your budgeted expectations. It is in red. It is there to flag up some of the issues that you may be having and you need to take action on those. And you do that for your income and you do that for your cost base as well because it's a great way of saying, well, I'm in control of this business. If there's a surprise going on, I need to look at my budgets and my forecasts to make sure that uh, it's there next time around. But also, is it an opportunity for me to drop that cost out altogether? There are many property investors, there are many entrepreneurs out there that do not you know, follow this due process of budgeting their business. And for me, it's a huge mistake. I look at my budgets pretty much on a weekly basis. Where am I? Where am I going to be? Am I on target? Because ultimately, I might be setting myself a hundred, two hundred, five hundred, a million pounds worth of profit in terms of expectations. 
You must be doing the same with your property business, but it's not until you do budgets and you kind of look for three months down the line, you can say, wait a minute, by now I should be generating, I don't know, 50,000 pounds worth of profit in the, these three months. I've only done 20,000, what is going on? And you can use this actual versus budget report to identify what actions you now need to take on board to generate the profits that you deserve and you wanted in the first place. So please do use budgeting. It's a fantastic tool and it's something that I would encourage you to do. Now, we've got another set of webinars coming up called the uh, Virtual FD and it's talking about the budgeting process, financial uh, top goals and targets. That's next Thursday and we talk about this in a lot of detail. Of It's talking about your personal goals and then taking your personal goals and then making those into sturdy financial budgets that you can then say, well, how do I go from this year to 10 years or five years down the line to achieve my end goal? And this is pre and that session focuses very much on budget. So please do note the importance of these things. Um, and I'm just going to touch base now. Just realize that we're going over time. So please stay with me if you can. Uh, it's only going to be another slide or two. So not much now to go. Uh, but your balance sheet, all it does is represents your assets of the company, which will be your building, your project extensions, your fixtures and fittings. That's all your balance sheet is really showing, as well as the assets showing as tenant debts. So the money that is owed to you, that is genuinely an asset to the company because it's money owed to the company. But you do need to make sure you keep track of that. And we'll talk about that a little later on. It will also have your bank accounts and your equipment as there as well. You will have liabilities in your limited company. And typically these are property specific. So you'll have property mortgages, um, but you will also have suppliers that may be doing work for you. So if you're doing a huge development and you've got an extension going on there, you may have uh, invoices that they're sent to you, which is due for that extension, and you still owe money to them. So that will be a liability of those properties. You've got generic liabilities as well, so overdrafts, long-term loans, JV loans, uh, those kind of things, and even uh, trade creditors that uh, you may have for your business. So stationary ordering, uh, for, for example, you may have 100 pounds worth of stationary ordering going on, which you owe money for your BT lines and stuff like that. They are all trade creditors that will fall under liabilities. And your balance sheet basically says, here's a bunch of assets, here's a bunch of liabilities, and if your assets are more than your liabilities, then that clearly is um, a good position to be in. What you don't want to be in really is where you've got more liabilities than assets because it means you're insolvent. It means that you are in negative equity, which is not, a good place to be, let's be fair. No one wants to be running that one. A little quick note, if I don't mind, about tenants and debts. Now you could have customer debts like this as well. This is again an example from Zero, and this is a very useful tool because it does tell you by your, uh, by your tenant, by your customers, by your clients, how much money they owe you. And one thing I would always say to you is make sure you get a system to chase these guys. This report is great, and all, but all it does really is uh, tells you that there's that's owed. In Zero, notably, uh, there is a functionality within Zero to automatically send tenants, and you guys may be receiving this from as, from time to time. Whereby, if you kind of accidentally forgot to pay an invoice, Zero we set up Zero so it will automatically send you an email to say, "Here's an invoice. This is what was expected to be paid." You can download the invoice and then it will give you the link to pay that online. Uh, so that is something that I would kind of ask you to do really. If you know your tenants or your customers and clients that have got email accounts, why not set up a, um, a system within Zero to automatically chase them for their invoices? Now, one thing I would say on that is being, back, being proactive. Again, how can you be proactive if all you're doing is stuffing receipts and invoices into a bin liner? No can do. You must be on top of your uh, your business. As it says at the bottom there, cash is king. You know, there's no point in generating lots and lots of money as profit if you haven't even got the money in from your tenants and your customers yet. So you must keep on top of it. So one of the things that I would always say is make sure you have a system that texts clients, uh, sends them emails. The emails are mentioned already that Zero has that ability to automatically send your, your customers 
um, due date. So you could send a reminder after one week, after two weeks, after a month, after three months. Um, but that automatically gets done. I would send texts as well to say, look, we've sent you a reminder. Uh, when are you going to put making payment to us? The next step is then calling them. There is nothing better than to have a good conversation with a tenant. Look, don't go into that phone call being all aggressive and mighty. Right, you pay my debts. That's not going to do anything good. That's just going to get their backs up. You are there as their customer. Well, you're they're your customer, you're a supplier to them. And that goes across any business activities you've got going on here. And what I would say on that is you need to be friendly with them because ultimately they, they are your customer, they are your clients, and it's all about building rapport. I would be saying to them, look, you've got this invoice, it's being overdue, it may be just an oversight, we may have issues with our systems not sending those invoices. First of all, let me just check with you, have you got that invoice with you? And they will check their records. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I forgot to pay it. I will get it done. And all of a sudden, the ownership is on them. The one thing I would do with that conversation is follow it up with an email. Make sure you go on and say, right, we had this conversation. I'm, uh, we've, we talked about this invoice. You said you would pay it on this particular day. I'm going to call you the very next day just to confirm that money's landed, which is common courtesy then, isn't it? Or if the money hasn't arrived, hey, we had an agreement, what is going on here? And that's when you need to make sure that you are keeping on top of your debts and you don't let them slide.